Okay, it is a Sunday morning, and I'm a little bit nervous to be filming this video. I think I need to put this on a little higher. Much better. Um, this is a unique video for what we've done on this channel so far. But basically what happened is it's a Sunday morning, and we just had this discussion with my kids where I charted out this belief that I think is really the basis for everything of why we started this whole channel to begin with. And I just did it on the chalkboard, like right here. It's like pretty ghetto. And I thought, well, what if I was to try and recreate that here? Because I think it's like the biggest, most life-changing thing that has happened inside of us. And it's actually a pretty simple concept, although I consider it very unintuitive. And it really transformed my life. So here it goes. I'm gonna try and explain that concept. Um, so it goes something like this. Um, there are different organizations that we are all a part of. So this is the organization. Now this could be um, a family. This could be a church. This could be a club. Um, this could be even a nation. And if you're not familiar with that term organization, you could also probably call it an institution, something that has boundaries around it that define who's on the inside and who's on the outside. <clears throat> now, inevitably what happens, and I'm gonna take the most obvious example here. Um, that we talk about all the time and that we deal with, which is family. Inevitably what happens is you find someone that operates outside of the accepted definition of how family ought to operate. So kind of the quintessential ones for me growing up was if someone starts using drugs or if someone starts acting dangerously or, I mean, it sounds kind of silly to say this, but it actually was like sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Um, if you were um, exhibiting like those types of behaviors, there was a very natural process that happened, which is the family would kind of like create distance from themselves and you. So they would like kind of put you outside of here and they were saying like, well, this is like what we identify as our family, and you're operating outside of this. Now, what prompted this whole discussion was we were listening to this podcast by a guy named Gabor Mate. Where'd my book go? This is a book that he has written. This is not the book that we will be discussing. Um, and he was in this discussion with this guy named Russell Brand. And I will link all of these resources. Um, I need to write down a podcast, what I need to link, otherwise I will forget. But what he says is, all of these people on the outside, um, and he was talking about, this is society, and these are people in jail, okay? Um, and these are people that do drugs. Now his philosophy of addiction, there's gonna be a lot of rabbit trails here, so thanks for your flexibility. Um, he says these people here, the reason why they're in jail, and quite often the reason why they're doing drugs, is they're doing these things to cover up trauma. They're doing things to medicate themselves because they can't deal with the feelings, they're too painful, so, a lot of why they end up in this situation. It's not because they're like, oh man, I really, really want to do drugs. It's because they feel like they have no other choice. Okay, now if you want to listen to more about his views on trauma, which is what he really has a huge emphasis on, you can listen to that podcast with him and Russell Brand. Actually, highly, highly recommend, especially the first hour of it, but all of it. Um, okay, so this is his kind of like mind-blowing point that really helps me. He says, instead of focusing on how bad these people are, what if we were to ask this question, what can society learn by the people that it basically has to outcast? 
So a lot of these people, the reason why they have so much pain is because they never fit into this structure ever. And so they have to medicate themselves with pain, or sorry, with drugs to deal with the pain. And every time we see one of these people outside, it gives society an opportunity to assess why are there some people that don't fit in? Now, I just wanna use one example. And that is that in jail, <clears throat> I think what you'll find is there's a higher percentage of black people and younger people. Um, and there's a lot of people in jail because of the criminalization of marijuana. And I'm using this because it's a very um, common topic nowadays. So jails are filled with these people um, who were smoking pot and everyone's like, everyone agreed that is bad. We need to send those people there because they're dangerous. Well, now the tide has kind of shifted and I'd be really surprised if in two years, marijuana is illegal really anywhere in the United States because public opinion has changed and we have come to more awareness. We've come to more tolerance. Whether you agree with it or not, I don't really care. But now we've changed, <clears throat> but these people are still in jail for doing something that we now consider acceptable. And instead of sending them off to jail, if we would have wrestled with that fact, why are these people doing this and how can we include them and their beliefs and their pain, I think it might have made this conversation progress a lot sooner and a lot earlier as a society if we would have allowed that. But I guess what I wanna say is, it is always easier to send people out and disassociate from them instead of using it as an opportunity to reform the system or institution. Now, I'm not saying that any of these forms, do those show up there? Uh, does that show up? Yeah. I'm not saying that any of these are bad, um, but they can create limitations. And that's one of the things I wanna talk about um, is how to approach some of those limitations. But before we get into that, I also wanna talk about this. Oh crap, this is all leaning on this book. Uh, okay. Um, this book by a guy named Peter Rollins, it's called The Divine Magician. This is another um, book that has been influential for me. <clears throat> and the first quote that really turned me on to him was by my friend Robin. And she mentioned this quote that he said, which was something along the lines of, the homeless people and the people in jail um, instead of looking at them as the problem, they reveal what's wrong with society itself. Now, when I first heard that, I'm like, ah, part of me doesn't like that. Like, obviously they have a problem, right? But I think it's easy to get so fixated on their problems that we miss out on the fact that there is something we can learn about our society by who we're not able to tolerate and who we exclude, and in a way, who we create. Um, and I'm not, I don't really wanna get into it, but I'll give like just one example. When, okay, sorry, I had to deal with the person at the door. Um, so instead of, well, going back to the homeless example, for a society that values people based upon their production capability, how much money they make, and how much they participate in a capitalistic system, homelessness is the absolute like lowest form that we have of a person. It's like, I mean, it is a caste system, it's just not one that we acknowledge a whole lot. So instead of like continuing to exclude and see homeless people as a problem, we could use that as a way to kind of examine the system that we've created but we all know it's so much easier to just ignore that. Um, anyways, one concept that Peter Rollins talks about quite a bit is this phrase called scapegoating. Um, now scapegoating is the first time I think it came across my radar was in a literary class in high school, English literature. Um, but when I started to focus more on religion and Christianity specifically, I came to understand the basis of scapegoating from the Bible. And I even went to like Jerusalem and I saw where they literally did this with a goat and what they would do, I believe it was once a year, there was a biblical holiday. Was it Yom Kippur? Is that the day of atonement? I think it might be, don't hold me to that. And what they would do is they would take a goat, a live goat, 
and they would, I forget whether they'd hit it or beat the crap out of it or what, but they would imagine stacking the sins of the nation or the people on this goat, and then they would send the goat away out of the city, presumably to wander, die, or starve, or something. It was the ultimate way of saying, this goat has our sins, it has our problems, get it out of here. Get it out of here. And what the problem with that is, is it's really disassociative. It says the problems are no longer here. I mean, obviously when you send a goat out of a culture, it, it's only symbolic. Like your sins don't actually go on the goat, even though I don't know if they actually believe that they did. But it's the ultimate way of saying this problem I have, I kind of don't want to deal with it. I'm putting it and sending it away. But that doesn't really solve anything because we still have the same problems that we think we're sending away. And in a way, when we create, when we scapegoat these people, it's a way of taking away the emphasis on ourselves of what can we learn about our own destruction, our own greed, our own way of dealing with reality. And instead we're projecting it on a few like select members of society and focusing on them. So scapegoating, although it sounds like this ancient ritual, is a very, very normal way of dealing with pain, dealing with, um, I don't know, probably our own issues. So it's so much easier to say, oh, the problem is out there instead of focusing on the problems that are in here. If you want to learn more about scapegoating, some resources that have been very helpful for me is once again, probably this book. There's an author named Rene Girard uh, who is incredibly difficult to read, but who writes about scapegoating immensely. Um, and there's also a podcast by a therapist named Dan Allender who has a few good episodes and I think summarizes scapegoating than anyone else I've heard. So I'll put those resources up here. But while this idea of scapegoating is probably necessary for certain stages of development, and I think even in ancient Israel, it might have been helpful, a uh, helpful stage. It's not someplace we want to end up on and say like, oh yeah, I sent the goat away, so I don't need to actually deal with this anymore. So this is where it gets um, a little bit personal, um, but this is our story, so I think there's no way to really get around sharing it. Um, what can we do about this as people? Um, and really this gets into the entire basis of why we started this channel and why we titled it Everyone Belongs. In this model, you can see that not everyone belongs. And of course, like what anyone's gonna say is, well, <clears throat> everyone never really belongs. I mean, we wouldn't invite anyone in our house. We have personal boundaries. We have a Facebook discussion group that not everyone is allowed to, so you're living really hypocritically. Um, and to that I say, well, there is a place for boundaries, but let me talk about one of the things that we have changed that I think kind of accounts for this. Um, some of the people that have kicked us out um, run organizations that are, oh man, I'm getting kind of tripped up here, but this is what I share with my kids today. <laughs> There's one thing to say, I like coffee and I like tea. And we're like, <laughs> okay, whatever, like no big deal, we're different. It's another thing to paint this picture of this um, organization right here as kind of being the ultimate or better than. Now one of the organizations that is run around here is called Family Teams. And what gets kind of created, there's almost a fetishization, fetish, fetish, fetishization of these types of organizations. Where not only are we saying we exist and you're not a part of it, we're saying this is the way, and what Family Teams teaches is basically saying like, this is God's way to run family. This is a superior way to run family. Oh, and by the way, you're not a part of it. So it's very different from a coffee or tea conversation in terms of like, oh, we're different but equal. And this is very much in my experience and my participation in the church, how the church sees itself. We viewed ourselves as not just having an answer, not just having a way to live. We viewed ourselves as having the God-given best truth. 
the only truth, um, the only better way to live, the superior way to live. And we really look down on other people that lived in different ways. The final example I'm gonna give is actually uh, some of my relatives plaster their houses with American national flag paraphernalia. So it's not just saying, hey, we're Americans, that is the landscape we're born into, oh, and you're an African. It's actually saying USA is like the best, most awesome place, and it's incredible and awesome, and we focus on like the amendments and the Bill of Rights and how incredible we are, which kind of, without even really realizing it, it's this fetishization of this club itself. And, and it's speaking to this line and saying this line is not just a necessary evil, it's not just something we have to deal with, it's something we wanna in build stronger and build up and talk about and, and almost like worship in a way. So instead of looking at these people that constantly get excluded as a way of learning and redrawing our lines and rethinking our lines, we kind of like tend to double down on the line itself and be like, the line is important and you're not in it. Which I feel like is a really tragic scenario because first of all, it cuts us off from these relationships. So while we, you know, in telling our story in this podcast, have been cut off um, from these organizations by the people inside of them in certain cases, my ultimate fear, let's talk about Family Teams, who's a family member of ours that runs this organization. My ultimate fear is that their own family members, their daughters and sons, at some point are going to disagree with some of these principles. When you have enough kids, like that's a fact, that will happen. Now, when that happens, there's two choices that those people will have. Those people will have the choice of being excommunicated and seeing as outside of the organization, or they'll have the more obvious choice, which is what we did for a lot of years, which is to fake it and hide it. So if you have a question or a wonder, you will push it down or you will not share it because being included, I mean, this is like what the fucking, I shouldn't swear, but this is what the fucking organization is called. So when you're taught that your faith, for example, is the most important thing about you from a very young age, you're taught that you, know, you don't matter, you're just a tool in God's plan and his kingdom, then when you're taught that certain actions or beliefs will actually put you outside of that, you mentally and emotionally almost have to suppress these certain realities about yourself and hide them even from yourself, but especially from people around you, in order to maintain Inclusion. So by doubling down on the importance of this boundary and not just saying, hey, these are things that exist, but these things are essentially the greatest things that exist, these organizations and families and clubs, and these walls are static and, and not admitting that they are dynamic, which is also, which are also, um, it's kind of a silly um, stance to take historically. Because if you look at what has held nations together over the years, I mean, America's what, two or 300 years old? It's not that old, like, and it's, it's actually fairly unique. Um, what has held together church membership over the years, like the belief system has changed and be very dramatically different from what it was 20 years ago or 40 years ago. Anyone that's been through it can tell you. Um, this definition of family, of like what constitutes a good moral Christian family, the, the bait and switch that kind of happens here, if you look at the certain websites and the way they define it, is they say very unspecifically and vaguely, we believe in God's design for family or something like that. And that indicates that there is one interpretation of this that's been pretty universal and pretty historical, which is actually like not very true at all. I mean, even, even if you look at the Old Testament, I mean, this is like a silly example that I don't even want to use, but when you're like, oh, we follow God's design for family. Well, it's like, well, do you practice polygamy? Because Abraham, the founding father of our faith, uh, you know, had concubines and mistresses and multiple spouses and all sorts of weird situations like that. But people dismiss what they don't want to take into account of. So instead of fetishizing this boundary and scapegoating these people, which I guess I want to pause 
for one other um, second and talk about what happens when we kick these people out. There's a lot of stories from my growing up, a few that are fairly graphic, that involve even like, um, well, destruction and suicide that happens to people when they're outcast from here. Because they're told that this is so important and then they end up here, um, you deal with a lot of pain. I mean, in addition to the pain that you're already dealing with from not being a part of someone's definition of nation, church, or value, now you're dealing with rejection, lost identity, accusations that may or may not be true, um, and a lot. So it actually makes really good sense to me why these people would actually pursue habits that are even more destructive and more dangerous to them, which once again, this group here could learn if they looked and said, if they took ownership over some of the impact that's happening, or in the Christian world we call it the fruit, they would actually say like, oh, what can we change to include these people? Um, but quite often the exact opposite is done and more distancing is created and they're pointing the finger and instead of seeing addiction as a symptom, they see it as some moral issue, um, which Gabor Mate talks a lot about in his viewpoint of addiction. He says we should stop looking at it as a moral issue and start looking at it as a symptomatic result. And that allows us as groups and individuals and societies to investigate and understand why things are happening more. Um, so instead of doing that, they distance themselves further and further because they double down basically on saying, no, our way is right, our way is important. These boundaries are what define us and you're outside of it. So I kind of want to finish this talk by sharing this one quote that is just one of the most influential things I've ever heard. And it's by that guy who wrote that book, like Seven Highly Effective Habits of People or something like that. Anyways, he wrote another book called Seven Highly Effective Habits of Family. <clears throat> and he said this thing, I'm gonna, it's not an exact quote, but he said, the most important child for us to love is the one that's the least lovable, is this one. Because, and this is where it gets really interesting, because deep down we all know that we're the least lovable, that we are just like them. So what he's saying is, you know, when we have this system of family and rules and four out of the five people follow the rules, Great, it's really easy to love other Americans and identify with other Americans or people that like your same sports team or people that affirm your same beliefs. But it's actually very difficult and the most important is to love the child that doesn't follow the rules and doesn't fit into that belief system and doesn't um, seem to you know, support your belief system. And how we incorporate that person is so important because what he's saying is we're all the same. Whoever we're othering, you know how I talk about scapegoating, we send the sin away, it never actually goes away. Um, and I'm using the a definition of sin very liberally. Uh, you know, whatever problems we don't like in someone else, the reason why we probably don't like it is because we don't want to confront it in ourselves. And every time we see that person that's wearing it on their sleeves on the outside, we have the ability to confront and face and probably more importantly accept it within ourselves. But when we push it away out here, we're pushing a piece of ourselves outside as well. I mean, this is the quintessential definition. Like you all have heard the example of like the pastors that are preaching the most against gay people. <laughs> you know, there's a good chance some of them are gay. Like this is like, this is such a common issue, but because you hate that thing inside of yourself, you have to project that hate outside to others. But if you were able to use that as an opportunity to accept those people, you could probably accept pieces of yourself that you almost have to hate and not accept. And it, it, it creates this, this war that is external actually is representative of a war that is very internal. So what do we do about this? Well, I don't know. <laughs> You know, we exist in this world. I was talking about the, this today with the kids. We exist in this world 
where we have to have these boundaries, you know? Like if one of our kids came in like literally with things on fire, like sticks, I would kick them out of the house because I don't want them to light the house on fire um, and hurt other people. And there's all different, you know, like, you know, um, analogies of that that we use. Um, but there's a difference in saying you're not welcome in this house or maybe fire is not welcome in this house right now and saying, you know, you don't belong here. I'm better than you because I don't have fire or I'm more special than you or something is wrong with you uniquely that's not wrong with me. So you go out there. So that makes me put less emphasis on this boundary and definition of organization. Instead of a solid line, you know, it's a dotted line. And it's a dotted line that's always changing and isn't sacred. Um, you know, what has defined nations and religions over the years has been a dynamic thing, I think, if you look into the history of it. And I'm always looking for ways to include and draw the line around as many people as possible, especially our own kids. I mean, this is very theoretical when it comes to church and things like that. And I understand for us, we were, our belief system and very presence was threatening to certain organizations. So they felt the need to reinforce this line. I get that. Um, but then it's another level to me when you start making judgments on how awesome this group is and you start using, you know, th this is what's tricky about religious organizations. They don't say these people suck. They don't say you're a loser. They don't use words like that. They talk about how much they love you and it's all this Christian positive lingo while it's happening. So that's one of the biggest like son of a bitches of this whole thing. And in, in, our, in my experience, that's what's taken 20 years to figure this out. If they were to just honestly say, we don't like you, we don't like having you around, um, you know, you make me uncomfortable, you piss me off, um, you're messing up my thing. Like that type of honest speaking would make this much more easy to figure out. But they say these things, they use words like sin, they talk about doing it for your own benefit, they say you're destroying yourself and we love you. Um, there's all these like biblical, vague, kind of like non-behavioral definitions that are used, like in our case, pride or even uh, misdiagnosing narcissism and things like that. <clears throat> um, oh my gosh, I just got totally sidetracked. Where am I? I guess the bottom line, it's not about association and saying, we're the same, I just can't deal with you right now, which I think is a totally appropriate use of boundaries. It's actually calling into question the person's value um, and their ability to, man, I can't even think of the word, but um, you know, words that are used are like unbeliever and lost, you know, in the spiritual community that we come from. So the conversations that I want to have on this channel is first of all to talk about like the bigger story. Instead of this being the biggest story, if there's a God or a reality that is love or positive or good, is it not big enough for him or her or it to include everyone and everything? Because if that exists, I would rather talk about that than to talk about this. And I have the feeling the more we talk about this and emphasize this and think about this, the less these lines matter. I'm like, oh, oh, you smoke pot. Oh, you're divorced. Oh, you didn't go to school for two hours late or whatever. These things that really tend to define and piss us off. If this is true, and this is where the title of our channel comes from, I think everyone does belong in the bigger sense. And if we can believe that, it will change how we define those that are different than us. And it will change how we have to exclude people, which in turn, if we go with the original quote that we started, what if these people actually can teach us about the places that we're not accepting in ourselves and that ways that we're not able to let love penetrate and reality penetrate, we now have this great tool, which is these people, like I think about this all the time with my kids, Sometimes they do these, this thing that really pisses me off, like making that noise right now. Um, 
and I can, I have two choices at the point. I can say, kid, you suck, you're dumb, this thing that you're doing is really uh, lame. Or I could say, you know, deep down, my hatred of your behavior is a reflection of my hate, of a certain area of my hatred of myself. And when I'm crazy, when I lose control, or when I have too much fun, I don't like that part of myself. I can't accept it because there's a chance that it's it's um, linked to maybe childhood trauma <clears throat> or something like that, which is the topic of this book. Anyways, this is this is the world that I want to explore. This is why this type of stuff is so important. So when this last um, week, when we made this review of this, um, this review of this review, <laughs> we talked about this review that someone wrote this scathing review saying that, oh, you know, you, you, they were attacking us, saying you are, you know, discounting this. I'm like, this is so crazy because what's happening is this type of thing. Um, and I actually think the more we double down on this type of behavior, I think it actually sets us back as a society and as a people group and as families, like reinforcing this type of like scapegoating mentality instead of trying to figure out how to find our commonality. And that's what gets me really pissed off. Okay, that's it. Was this helpful? This was like really, I didn't, I don't, I didn't plan on doing this, but when I was explaining this to my kids, by the way, it only took 10 minutes when I explained it to them. Um, I was like, you know, this is all the stuff that really, really motivates um, and has changed my life. And it's the most condensed we can do it right now. I hope to get it more condensed in the future, but it's the best we got for today, Sunday morning church. Hope you enjoyed it. Leave a comment. What do you um, agree with? What do you disagree with? What's not clear? Thanks for listening.